Hey everybody. Just thought I'd do a little update on uh, kind of how things are going here and the kids and everything. We do so many things like in terms of videos and uh, meetings and things like that. But a lot of times it's in, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to expand my screen so I can actually see what I'm doing here. Cause I'm gonna show some, I'm gonna share some things as well. Well, we'll see, leave it like this. Um, but what I was saying was I, we do like, we do a podcast, um, every week. Uh, it's, it's myself, it's, um, Asif, Drake and Mitch and Christine. Now she's helping us with like the production and stuff. And, uh, we do that every week. We've been doing that for, I think almost two years, if not two years now, something like that. It's probably coming up on two years, which is crazy actually. Um, it doesn't seem like that. It doesn't feel like that. Uh, but, you know, we do that every week, but that's kind of more us having a conversation and, you know, I give a lot of what's going on in my life and stuff in that. Um, but it's also, we kind of talk about a lot of different things and, you know, it's also for entertainment and so forth. And we also do a lot of meetings like we have. So for people who have TechnoTutor, TechnoTutor clients specifically, um, we have several groups and there's a lot of groups actually um but there's several that i'm specifically a part of or that i direct one it's a parenting group and in there we generally talk about parenting um, education for kids and just those general topics and then we also have a something called a self-leaders club which is for young men who have techno tutor and it, all of these are by invite only so just because someone has TechnoTutor doesn't mean they automatically are in those groups, but it's like we want specific, we specifically want people who are teachable, but also want to, you know, apply themselves within the processes that we're talking about and consider the principles we're talking about and so forth. So they are exclusive. Um, and we also have, well, there's a lot of other groups, but those are two specifically that I uh, moderate, administer, and we do those every two weeks. Uh, so we have one every week, but they alternate. So we do those. And then obviously for people who are TechnoTutor distributors specifically, we have calls every week, several calls. And we're always doing uh, discussions and things on those meetings and so forth. And um, so my point is that we, I talk a lot about our life and everything, but it's usually in context where the general average public, let's say, is not going to necessarily see all of that. Um, there's a lot that I can share in more specificity when we're in a group context where people are specifically applying the things we're talking about because outside of those groups, people generally are not going to understand because they're not using the tools that would support them to be able to understand but also to actually in real practice apply what we're talking about because we're never giving general advice. I don't care about giving general advice um, because without the tool, like, the general advice wouldn't have applied to me before I was using these tools walking this process uh, because it's specific to these points. It's specific to the principles that we that we discuss. And I've made many videos about those principles. I have lots of videos on my YouTube channel. Um, but I, I really wanted to just, since I have some time in between now, And like uh, the really, the really the thing I wanted to talk about the most was the rapid development that I've been noticing in our children, specifically both of them really. Well, we have three children now. We had Caius; he was born on the second, twenty uh, second rather of February. Um, so that was re very recently, but obviously the bulk of the time I've spent as a parent was with our other two kids. So usually I'm going to be referring to them specifically because Kais is still an infant. Um, and generally you'll notice I mostly, if you follow what I do, I'm always talking a lot about what Max does. And that's primarily because he's sort of the leading edge. And if I don't say something about Seneca reading or whatever, it's only because in a certain sense, we've already talked about it. Like it's not surprising anymore. It's not that it's surprising to us when Max, as Max is developing, it's expected, but it's still surprising. It's still, 
not surprising in the sense of like again we didn't expect it but it's just like you know it's like when you when you when you follow a recipe and you're like okay i'm doing this properly and then it turns out great you're not surprised but you are surprised i mean you did everything properly according to the way it was supposed to go but the result is still maybe it's maybe surprising is the wrong word maybe it's just you're, you're impressed with it you're you're like in awe of it you know and so that's a lot of times how I feel about Max and Seneca, seeing them develop. And, but again, a lot of times the reason why I talk about Max is just because he's sort of the leading edge and he's sort of doing a lot of the things first before Seneca does. And in every case, if, if Max did something at three years old, Seneca's doing it at three years old. Um, if he did it at two years old, she's doing it at two years old. She learned to recognize her alphabet around the same age that he did. Um, she uh, like she started learning she started being able to recognize words and read around the same time he did and so forth so uh, I, I, I do make an attempt to share specifically about things Seneca is doing but what I typically will share with her about her is things that she's she's walked through that are unique to her like um, I have some videos I have a video a couple videos on our YouTube channel where um, she was holding a frog and you could see she was so nervous about it and Katie was really supporting her to breathe and just walk through that point and now she loves it's like almost every day she's asking me can we go find frogs and of course it's just, we're just now getting out of winter so there weren't a lot of frogs around um, but like worms like when we go fishing she loves to hold the worms and play with the worms and they're like her friends so she's walked through that so that was something that was unique to her Max didn't really have that resistance um, there's different things that occur. So a lot of times what you'll see me sharing with her is things that are pretty extraordinary to watch a child go through, but that maybe was unique to her, for example. So, um, and then there are obviously going to be differences. Like children are going to have different press preferences. Um, Seneca likes to dance and physically express herself, whereas Max um, typically likes to... Uh, and of course, again, it's hard to even draw comparisons because they're at different ages. Max likes to run around and play and be physical as well. It's just in a different way, right? Seneca has more of that feminine sort of um, dance sort of expression with of her. And, and she also likes to jump off things and do things differently physically than Max does, although they're both still very physical children. Um, they'll both climb up to the top of a gigantic dirt hill, for example, and, and, and play and so forth, right? So there's a lot of similarities, obviously differences. The one thing that's not different between children is how they learn, though. And I know a lot of people will disagree with that. They won't have a valid reason for disagreeing with it. They'll, they'll disagree with me on that point because they won't understand fully the context of why I'm saying that. And I'll, I'll explain, and I have explained this before. I have a video called, it's like the number one myth in education or the biggest myth in education or something, which is that point that everybody learns differently. It's not true. Um, it's just that, as I point, as I explain in that video, you're seeing the end result of not directing the inputs of, uh, according to how a child actually learns, you don't direct all those inputs effectively and it starts to create essentially inequality within how people process information. There are other factors that go into it, environment and genetics and so forth. But again, those are really just inputs if you think about it. Um, some of those inputs, we know how to direct very effectively. Some of those, it's more generational inputs that as we adjust the environment and make it more supportive for everybody, those inputs will be adjusted over time. So like long-term generational genetic things can be adjusted, but with the exception of some sort of like specific breeding of you know genetic lines and so forth i mean you're going to have to do it their environment over time right uh so that's kind of another discussion but my point is the way children learn is by absorbing everything in their environment all the sounds primarily sounds later it's visual imagery but even the visual imagery works on the basis of sound to a certain degree it's just it's not going to make sense, but the sound is more important, actually. Um, and, and nothing I'm saying is, is um, controversial, actually. Nothing I'm saying is not already technically known. It's just that a lot of people can't connect all the dots, or they haven't really actually done the research, and they have opinions based on what, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, the system wants you to know. 
it's not actually the case. It's just what you what what you uh, what the system wants you to think and perceive, so that you're more easily controlled, and also so that you're more unstable. The more stable you are, the less you depend on the system to give you everything. Which is not to say that we don't depend on the system. It's just that you're less self-directive, and therefore um, you have less direction over the system. You can't change it as effectively. Uh, and it's not to say that individuals can change the system, but individuals working together in a group with principles can. And so it's very difficult for people to work together as individuals in a group based on principles. It's fascinating because to a certain degree, humans are act like collectivist herd animals. They're very easily herded and uh, directed as a collective, but it's not through a self-directive point. It's through an exploitation of imagery, perception, control, all kinds of things. And then we get this point where we're like, well, we want to be individuals, but then we don't do that within principles, so we end up just creating conflict. So no matter how you look at it, it's not a real self-directive based on principle point, whether you're individualist or collectivist. So not educating children effectively is the beginning of all of this all of these points, all this conflict that occurs. And again, the way in which children receive information as their initial inputs is the same. Across the board, every human being is the same. But again, because it's not directed effectively, primarily because parents themselves have no idea. They have no idea. It's the most, actually it's the most simple, basic thing, how children actually learn. And I don't mean simple as in it's, uh, like if you don't get it you're stupid or something it's just you overlook it you don't know you don't consider it you don't sit down because you're constantly in a struggle in a race to survive and compete and you got to go to work and you got to do this and you got to make dinner and then you got to and then you want to entertain yourself to relax from the stress of all that stuff so you never really sit down and just look at the practical reality of things you know it's like how do you grow vegetables it's actually very simple i'm not saying it's easy it's hard work but it's actually very simple and most people don't know how to do it and they would think, oh, I, I can't do all that or something. You know, they would think it's too much, right? Same thing with computers. Computers are very simple. The design of them is very simple. They're also complex, but the basics of it is very simple, and you could learn it if you knew how to integrate the vocabulary. Um, so my point is parents, you know, I don't, it's not that I think all other parents are dumb or something like that or they're bad. It's just they don't understand these basic points that we do, and so they don't know how important very specific basic things are so they get that wrong and that produces problems later in the child's character their ability to learn all kinds of dysfunctions and so forth so we're just very specific about that with our kids and that doesn't mean we don't make mistakes but the mistakes are not deliberate obviously they're also based on the fact that uh, we're still in our own process of changing a lot of the ineffective inputs that were put into us as children so it takes time and you know sometimes the ego takes over and are you a lot we allow that you know each of us individually allows that from time to time and kind of have to start over in a certain sense and you know it's, it's a process it's it's not it's not easy at all by any means although it is simple um that being said we're we're doing a pretty good job with supporting our kids development and I try to post a lot of that stuff. You know, um, I'm not claiming to be an expert in how to share things on social media or how to present information and so forth from that perspective, but uh, we do put a lot of videos out there. It's not like we're like everyday blogging and stuff, you know, doing the vlogs and all that stuff of here's the kids every day or something like that. We're not trying to create some kind of following of people following our life or something from that perspective, although we do want people to see what we're doing. Um, but we put out content so that, for example, primarily our distributors, those are who are walking with us in this process, can then share that with people one-on-one. -on -one. That's really the point of it. But I thought I'd do something like this just to kind of give a little bit more perspective because um, it'll be publicly, you know, more publicly available on, YouTube, on Facebook. I'll also put this on YouTube probably. Um, so that's just a little bit of context. The point, though, is we do we are very specific about directing the inputs with the kids, and it, it it's so it comes down to even how the child learns the letters, 
that all of our language and information is based on. And for lack of uh, for lack of a more <laughs> Diff, you know, a lack of another way of saying it. It's like you just have to use TechnoTutor and integrate those. Those of you who don't have it or haven't seen it, don't know what it is, that's not going to make sense. If you just reach out to me, it, that can be explained. But the point is, if you don't do it this way, which is based on how the child actually learns in the most effective way, it's, it's not that we've invented a new thing, although it is new. It's just that we've created something to work actually with how the child actually learns and no one has done that before if that makes sense right and i'm not personally the person who created and came up with the idea but we are the ones who are taking that idea forward into the world and making sure that people have access to it in a very specific way of course um so when i say how it's how you learn this it's how you learn that matters i'm saying using techno tutor okay any other, anything else is going to be inferior to that. And there's, there's always like the best way to do something. And then there's just everything else that's not best. And sometimes people can look at, because they don't understand what's best. They just look at, okay, there's some good things and some bad things. And they think that the good things are um, just the best. Way. They, 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 they sort of rationalize it as it's the best thing, even though it's not. Um, so what I'm saying is it's actually not good. It's actually not best, but you're just looking at it as a polarity between two things. It's like, should I do private school or public school? Well, is private school better than public school? In many cases, yes. Is it the best? No. So they're both bad. You, you know what I'm, you understand? Um, obviously, without full context, that statement isn't going to make sense, and you're going to just try to argue with me and all this stuff. But again, you don't have all the context that I have, so I can I know why it's not best. I know that. I'm not just claiming it. I know it. And it would be. And I made videos talking about all these things, so it's. I'm not going to explain the context because I've done that already. It's somewhere else. You can go look. Um, it's just an example. You know, it's like. It it'd be like saying. Um, I was just trying to think of an example that could be easily related to with like nutrition, for example. It's like, um, should you drink Gatorade or should you drink purified drinking water? And it's like, well, clearly you should drink purified drinking water. But is that the best? It's not. Like, it doesn't have all of the mineral content that you need. It, there's a whole bunch of points that maybe the purified drinking water doesn't have that, that it's missing, even though it's way better than drinking Gatorade all day, for example. So it's just an example, obviously. So it's like that with education is my point. There's a lot of things you can do. You can do Montessori, unschooling, Waldorf, this, that, all these different things. And that's better than just not teaching your kid anything. That's better than just neglecting your child. That's better than just putting them in the public school. But they're not the best. And that's the point. So what I wanted to do... Uh, until I have to go, obviously, today, um, which I have a meeting in about 40 minutes. So, And I wanted to get lunch before then, so we'll just see. I'll talk a little bit, and then I'll end it. Uh, but I wanted to just give a little update on terms of where Max and Seneca are at and more focusing on the development for Max because, again, he's like that leading edge. Because you've seen, if you've been following our life at all, you've already seen a lot of what Max has done in the past in terms of when he was two years old and he could, or when he was... 16 months old, you could recognize the letters of the alphabet, upper and lowercase. Seneca could do the same thing. So it's like they're in this, she's following the same path. Um, but, and I know this is like the lowest tech way of doing this, but um, it was just the easiest for me to put together. But I just want to emphasize like, what we're doing is not just academic. I don't mean academic meaning like what we're doing is like theoretical in that sense. I mean, it's not just academic for the kids. It's not just about their being good in school type thing because that's how people think of education. Generally speaking, they think of it as school, like learning algebra, learning math, learning science, learning to read. And it, it is all of those things, but it's way beyond that. I mean, this is a, this is a picture, and I don't know if it'll focus easily, but this is a picture of the kids on the couch just playing together and I had I think I had just come home when I took this pic you know and they're just playing right Seneca has a little like cloth thing that they made which is like her pretend blue hair and I think they were playing with a balloon 
and you'll, you can find them like that anytime during the day just like playing together and sometimes they're not playing together they're doing something on their own and sometimes they have conflicts too um like you know max might be sitting there at break or at dinner and he might drink some of seneca's milk and she might say like she might get frustrated she might say max what are you doing don't drink my milk and then they might argue about it and then we just support them like hey what's the conflict what's going on and they're like well max drink my milk I'm like okay max why did you do that oh I just wanted it or oh I didn't realize I grabbed the wrong cup okay Seneca um, can you communicate more clearly with Max Max I don't want you to do that and then we talk about it they you know it's like we stabilize it uh, so these things don't escalate there's not this like if I come home and the kids are by themselves I'm not just waiting for that point where they start fighting generally that's not happening there's no oh, Max is bothering me again, or Seneca's bothering me again. It's like, because those are patterns. Those are characters that develop within the children. So when we identify these characters, what we do is we support the children, we direct them within changing that character, removing the points that aren't best, and adding the points that are. It's a process, and you have to know what you're doing, and you have to have the right tools, and that's part of what we support parents to do in our parenting group for those who have TechnoTutor and are interested in that kind of stuff is we would go into more detail on how would you do something like that? How do you end sibling rivalry, for example, or how do you prevent it in the first place? Uh, so they don't have any rivalry. They work together in most cases, right? And there's a lot of things where they just do on their own. That's fine. So I just wanted to show you all that picture. And I mean, the kids are very kind. Uh, here's Seneca after the baby was born, after Caius was born, holding him, right? I have, no, I have a picture that's just like this of Max holding him, holding him as well. I just got this one on the album that I put together before the before I started recording. Um, but like every morning, when Katie brings si Caius in, you know, after he, she's woken up and she's got him or whatever, or if Seneca's already awake, or if she's not and she sees Caius when she wakes up, she's like, Caius, Caius, I want to kiss him. Can I hold him? Like constantly, right? So they both get they both are doing very well with the baby handling that point. They don't see the baby as a threat, and and they really don't. I don't just saying that like in the sense of like uh like i'm imposing that idea on the point like it's actually the case i can see that they do not see the fact that we have another child now as a problem they're like hey let's help okay you need to go do that fine we'll play together right now while katie needs to go and change his diaper or breastfeed him like they understand what's going on um here's some examples so here's max watching a video i, I downloaded for him about logic gates see if that focuses I guess that's an XOR gate All right it's called an exclusive OR gate you can study these things and um, you might you know it's like lately he's been develop further developing his interest in electronics um, that's not accidental like I, I introduced those things to him early on Katie and I did uh, he's been playing with circuits since she since he was like two years old. Like like we have circuits uh, circuit kits that little kids can play with, and they're normally used for you know elementary middle schools to teach about things. I'm not saying this is typical in a school to have these, but that's what they're used for usually those things. Um, so he's had those for a long time, and we integrated vocabulary, resistors, uh, capacitors, battery, voltage, current, ohms. You know all of the vocabulary. And we've posted a lot of videos through his development of him when he's little, like reading instructions on how to create circuits and so forth. And now he's creating his own books. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but I uploaded on my YouTube channel. I posted it here on Facebook also. Uh, this book he wrote called Max's Binary Book because he'd been watching some of those binary and logic videos that I was just showing a screenshot of or a picture of. And... Uh, I came home and he's got this book he wrote where he's like drawn out the logic circuits or the logic gates. He's shown like what the inputs are that give certain outputs. He's shown like truth tables, which are like, well, I don't have it on here. I mean, I have it somewhere, but it's not in my album that I put on here, but uh, you can go watch that video on, it's called Max's Binary Book on my YouTube channel. And the truth table stuff is stuff that I did like second or third year in college while I'm pursuing a mathematics degree. So I wasn't even exposed to that stuff until university, right? And so he's, and, and the, the other thing about it, here's another picture. Here's him drawing out 
this was before he wrote that little book I was talking about. Here's him drawing out some logic circuits. You can see some of them. There's like not gates, and gates, all kinds of stuff. And these are these are uh, these are models of or diagrams of uh, components of how computers uh, function, basically, for just a simple idea. So it's basically he's just drawing out diagrams of the basic building blocks of how computers and logic operates, and he understands them. So I'm in that video, that binary book video uh, that I uploaded, he's showing me the book and then explaining everything on every page. So this is not he's watching a video and like copying it. This is he watches the videos. He's integrated the vocabulary and techno tutor. And then throughout the day when he's playing, he'll just go randomly get paper and a pen and he'll just start drawing them and writing them and putting them together. And. Oh, I'm going to find while I'm talking, there was one thing I definitely want to show you. Oh, here it is. Got it. Easy. I'll show you this real quick. This, uh, let's see if it shows up. This is a circuit diagram he drew. Put it on. There we go. Oh, wait. I had it. There we go. I'm trying to get rid of that glare. Right? It's a circuit diagram he drew of, it's got like, the TR is a transformer, and he wrote three volts. He's got a nine volt battery there, you can see. Uh, let's see here. I know there's a glare. I'm sorry. Nine volt. Looks like the nine's a little backwards, but he wrote a nine volt. He's got a resistor on there. He's got an LED. And then you see it says AC under the battery. And then it says DC over there near the LED. And he's got a little formula. AC plus R equals DC. And then he wrote DC is what we need for the LED. Oh, okay, okay. It's funny because I... I saw this before, and I only just now fully processed what he was saying there. So what he had explained to me was that this was a circuit that would convert the AC current from a battery into DC current to run the LED, because the, the, the LED, he said, needs DC current, which I didn't understand before that it was for the LED. I just thought, because before he just told me, oh, it converts AC to DC. I was like, okay. But it's specifically so the LED can function. And he wrote a little algebra equation because I've been teaching him algebra. And he can solve basic algebra equations. Uh, try to get it to focus again. There we go. AC plus R equals DC. And so what he was asking me, although he didn't write this down, what he was asking me is if the transformer is rated for 3 volts and the battery is rated for 9 volts, so he's looking for you to solve for R, which is the resistance. Because he kept saying to me, what would be the resistance we need? And now I'm like just now fully processing what he was writing here. This is not something that he copied down from a video. Like this is straight out of his imagination. And by imagination, I don't mean fantasy. I mean like from his mind of something he understands, writing it down. Um, he's five years old. And, you know, it's funny because when he was like two or something like that, and he was already recognizing the alphabet and I have videos of that kind of stuff. And right before he was three, he was already reading at a basically a first grade level. And I remember I had lunch with, with someone I knew. And then they had, a, they, had, they had brought someone to the lunch. And they were some kind of master's degree or PhD in early childhood learning or something at Neuhaus, which is this famous, prestigious uh, learning center in Houston. It's a bunch of people who have degrees but don't fucking know a thing about education, basically. Um, but it was funny because I had lunch with this with this woman, and I was telling her about Max. Cause that was the purpose of the lunch was for her to. This person had set up this talk, this this you know this lunch with us. So I was just telling her about what we've been doing and everything and what Max is doing, and she was like, "Oh, well, yeah, I mean that's cool." Because I was like, "He's he's." I explained what he was doing at two years old, and she was like, "Well, I mean he's clearly got very smart parents." And she had no fucking interest whatsoever in how we were actually doing it. Um, and it was just like, it, this wasn't the only encounter that I'd had with people in the education system not actually caring about the substance of what we're doing. Not at all. And we're, and we're very clearly explained to them, this is something that anyone can do. It's not unique. Like, I'm not trying to just brag or, or impress you. Any person can do this. The problem is, in the education system, there's no one-on-one -on -one interaction. I mean, I'm not saying there's none, but what I mean is it's you put a bunch of kids in a classroom, 
and then you administer some information to them. But there's no a person with that child who intimately knows that child and is working with that child and helping them develop themselves into a human being. And so the teacher doesn't know what word the child learned this week or last week or what thing influenced them or what they reacted to or what their fear is or their preference. They don't know any of that stuff. Only the parent can know that stuff about the child. And only if the child, the parent is spending all their time with the child. That's why, you know, if you're, if we're friends or whatever, um, you'll, you'll never see Katie and I together without the kids. Like there's no date nights. There's no, we're coming over to your house for a dinner party and there's a babysitter because number one, and it's not just because we're paranoid that the babysitter might hurt the kids. I mean, obviously that's a concern, but even if it was somebody that, um, we trusted from a certain perspective, that's not going to happen because we need to be there to be able to direct everything with the children. And you might think that that's like some kind of helicopter parenting or something like that, but it's not like my kids have far less fear than even the kids who don't have the helicopter parents. And like, I'll show you. I mean, let me find my albums again. Here's my daughter, Seneca. She's three years old. And that is a gas powered 90 cc uh, ATV. And she can drive it without the limiter. And I'll tell you a funny story about that. Here we, here's, here's Max. And oh, I think you can see Seneca barely in the background. That's us doing a little fire in the front yard. And they put the sticks in there. Oh, I don't have the video. Uh, we have like a blowtorch. It's like a propane blowtorch. And Max is lighting the fire with the blowtorch. Like we're not, uh, you know, oh, don't look at that. Don't like one of the things that was really interesting is in the beginning, we would go out when Max was very small. We would go out places and we would see parents always like grabbing stuff out of the kids' hands, out of their mouth. We never did that. We would always just be like, hey, Max, like, you know, when he's like, obviously like an infant, you know, if they pick something up, you know, you can gently take it away from them so they don't swallow it. But when they're one, two years old, you can communicate with them. Now, you might not think you can, but you actually can if you know how to do it properly. Um, and so we were never grabbing stuff out of his hands. We were always like, hey, Max, don't put that in your mouth because if you do, you could swallow it or be careful. Like we would explain. So by the time he was like one and a half years old and same with Seneca, they weren't putting stuff in their mouth like that. You know, they'd put like food in their mouth, but they're not just at the park, like randomly picking up plastic and shit. Like, and you'd see children that are way old enough that should, if you understood what we did and you applied it, they shouldn't be doing those things. But instead, the, it's because the parent was always just grabbing it. They never taught the child to understand, to not do it themselves. So with the blowtorch, I'm not just like, oh, here's a blowtorch. I'm like, let me show you how it works and explain. Here's the valve. Here's how the gas works. There's a spark and da da da. I explain everything. I have to hold it like this. If you have it on and you just turn it, you're gonna burn something. You know, like you explain all the context. Um, I was trying to find. Look, here's the kids. Right here's Max playing in some mud right on the front on the back end of our property right they and then Seneca very soon fell off fell over into it because her feet got stuck you know and then we just laughed about it and then we walked back you know to the house or got back on the RATVs and drove back to the house it wasn't a big deal after we played for probably an hour with muddy clothes um here's Seneca fishing right she reels it in herself it's got a real hook or the real worm on it right and so my point is we are, we're specific about the things that matter and we're very, we give a lot of freedom to our children, children as well. So if we're at home, they might be off playing, you know, in the dirt by themselves together and like we're inside, um, you know, and they have the dogs with them. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to go drop them off at a daycare. Do you, do you see the difference, right? One is the inputs are directed and we know there's no fucking like farm equipment with metal spikes sticking up in the ground where they're going to go fall on it. We've directed, we prevented that kind of a thing from happening. Those things will be put away or whatever it is. Or we know that the child don't understand, hey, you don't go climbing on the tractor when I'm not there because you could accidentally, hypothetically, if the bucket was left up and you push the lever, it could fall down. Of course, I'm very careful that I would not leave the bucket, you know, raised up in the air, but I'm just giving you an example. Um, if you want to ride ATVs, you come talk to us first and we'll give you the key and then bring it back when you're done. 
or maybe I would go riding with them or something, right, in most cases. So they have a lot of freedom. We're not controlling everything. What we are controlling is the inputs to make sure that, and here's, here's, here's the primary thing. Here's an example, okay? And I just wanna show you this, this is important. Here is Seneca, okay? And in that picture, I'm pretty sure she's pretending to be Prince Caspian from uh, the, the book series about the Chronicles of Narnia. And here's, actually, here's Max reading the Chronicles of Narnia, right? While he's wearing his dragon costume, right? Because one of the characters turns into a dragon. And I, I would suggest you go look up Chronicles of Narnia and actually look at the actual, the real one, not some watered down version. And look at the text of that and ask yourself, how the fuck can that five-year-old read that? Right? But that's how effective Technotutor is, if you do it the way we're suggesting. Um, but what the reason I was bringing those two points up is because a lot of times parents will impulse their children with this idea of fantasy, pretend, make-believe, and specifically the word magic. Um, and I mean, I could do a whole video just on this particular point if you want more context. And of course, those are the things that we talk about quite often in our parenting group. So you can, it's not like I haven't talked about this before, but my point is it's a separate conversation, but I like to always give context as much as possible when I make statements, but it's like, we don't lie to our kids about magic and tell them it's real. I mean, I'm not talking about sleight of hand, that kind of illusion magic I'm talking about, which obviously we know that's not real either. But my point is we're not like, I'm not believing that parents lie to their kids about that, although some do. I'm talking about Disney. I'm talking about the magic of Christmas. I'm talking about the magic. Magic. It's not real. Um, if magic were real, there wouldn't be a fucking war in Ukraine right now. Okay? If magic were real, there wouldn't be 22,000 children dying of starvation every year or is it every day or whatever the fuck the, 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 the number is. Magic is not real. Magic is a desire to experience something more than uh, the daily grind. And there are those moments, I understand that. It's a feeling, it's all it is, it's a feeling inside of you. And you can place a lot of value on that feeling or not. So I'm not denying that the feeling isn't there, but we know magic's not real. Like when you read Harry Potter, we know they're not really doing sorcery. Uh, when you go to Disney, we know that the magic isn't real. It's just a, it's, you have placed value on certain words. You have feelings that you associate with those words. Those words, those symbols trigger feelings and you call that magic. Same thing with Christmas. You watch the kids run downstairs and open up the presents. You get a good feeling. You call that the magic of Christmas. Okay. Um, we don't lie to our kids to produce that. So in other words, I don't have to lie to the kids and tell them, oh no, magic is real. If you just gotta believe and oh, put the tooth under the tooth under the uh, pillow and the tooth fairy will come. Uh, or if, you, if you're a good little boy or girl or you believe in Santa, he's gonna bring you presents. And like, my kids know what Santa is and they like the character of Santa. They think it's funny. They think it's fun. They like Christmas trees, but they're not, they don't believe that Santa is a real thing because you and I know it's not. You know that it's not. People will be upset that I would say that because it's like, well, how would you deny your child the magic of Christmas? And what's interesting is my children, those feelings, those, those excitements, those fun, my children have that. And we also don't lie about it. So you should ask yourself, well, how is that possible? My children love their life. And it's like every day my kids wake up and they come and they hug me and they say, Cameron, I really like being here. They say things like that. Like, I remember one time we were talking about heaven and I was talking to Max about the concept of what people believe heaven is, but what heaven really means. It's a world that would be best for everybody. It's a context where everything is best for everybody. And he was like, oh, well, our house is like heaven. And that's what he said when he was like three, or two and a half, something like that, right? Um, of course, they also understand the context of things that happen in this world. We're very open with them about things and we give them all the context. So they're not just processing it through an emotion, they're processing it through an understanding. So they understand what Christmas is. They understand what Santa is. They understand what the concept of magic is. It's for, it's for playing, it's for fun, it's pretend. And if you ask them, they're like, oh, I'm, 
I'm a, I'm a dragon right now. I'm like, you could ask them, are you actually a dragon? They would say, no, I'm just pretending. But they'll still pretend like it. You can pretend without believing it's true. And without going into the whole depth of that conversation, it's like, do you want your child to understand reality or not? Because if you say yes, then I would ask you, well, at what age do you want them to understand it? Because if you're like, well, when they're 12, okay, well then up to that point, they're gonna be fucking retarded and they're gonna struggle with learning algebra. Like, in other words, all the problems that you're gonna face in their education is because you didn't just educate them effectively, correctly from the very beginning, all right? And I'll just show a couple more things because I have to get off in a moment for my meeting. Um, here's Max. This was so cool because I didn't know how to use this thing. He was teaching me how to use it. It's a multimeter, and he's measuring the resistance of a resistor on his circ on his. Uh, it's called a breadboard, but he's got a bunch of electronic components in there. And I was looking at it, going because we were trying to figure out if some circuit was working properly. It didn't seem like it was. And I, and I kind of knew the general idea of how you can test two points on the circuit. And I was like, well, and I was looking at it going, um, I was like, see, Max, I'm not sure how to do this right now because, and I was like, maybe I need to look up a video. I said, because I don't know, there's two, there's two settings for voltage. Why are there two settings for voltage? I was just talking out loud. And he goes, well, Cameron, that's because that one's for measuring AC current and that one's for DC current. He goes, you know, if it's something that you plug into the wall, it's going to be running on AC. But if it's something like a battery, it's DC. So you need to be using the whatever, whatever it was, like the DC side or something like that. And I was like, oh, oh, OK. And then, like, I learned that point from him because he had been watching videos on how to use a multimeter. And then, and then I went and I asked Katie. I was like, Katie, I said, when was the last time Max played with the multimeter or, like, watched videos on it? And she looked at me like, Cameron he hasn't seen that multimeter since you just got it down and it's been sitting in that box for like a year or whatever it was like, meaning he hasn't been playing with it. That video he watched was a long time ago. So this wasn't like he just watched the video or something. It was amazing. Um, here's, uh, here's Max looking at a kit that we bought. He asked me to get him a kit to build something. He's looking at some package of resistors and then here's a little circuit board. It's called a PCB that we're soldering. You can't really see it too well, but we're soldering all the components onto it. That was at the very beginning. We've, done, we've made a little bit of progress on it. But he reads, you can see the instructions with his hand on it in the background. He's reading the instructions to me. He's like, okay, we need the uh, 20,000 ohm, and it says 20K, but he says 20,000 ohm resistor, um, a ceramic resistor, or not ceramic resistor, uh, whatever the word would be. I, I don't even remember. It's like a specific type of resistor because multiple types and so forth, right? He's like, we need this type of resistor with this uh, uh, resistance at location R15. And I'm looking on our, I'm like, this one? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, let's do it. And then I do the soldering because it's actually dangerous, like if you don't know how to do it properly. Um, but now that he's watching me do it, I bought some more kits and I'm going to show him how to do it a little bit better. Of course, that would be something that we would do under very close supervision. Um, but for now, I'm, I'm doing the physical soldering, but he's telling me where to put everything. So we're having fun doing that together. And what's fascinating is he understands everything we're doing, in some cases better than I do, because, and that's not to say like, oh, I'm just so dumb, I can't figure it out. He's so much smarter than me. It's just, no, like, he's spending a lot of time studying that stuff. I'm doing other stuff. I'm. We're, we're, I have a business. Uh, I'm doing stuff on our property, other things that I wish I could have been doing what he's doing when I was his age. I mean, can you imagine how grateful he's going to be when he's 12 and he already has mastered basic electronics, computer programming, mathematics, algebra, calculus, because he's already watching videos on calculus and he's 12 years old. I mean, go read the biographies on, go read the everything store. When Jeff Bezos was like 12 years old, they, there was a person touring his school and he was assigned to her as sort of like the student to shadow. And he's talking about these little invention he's making and all this stuff when he's 12 years old. What do you think Max is gonna be doing when he's 12? What do you think Seneca is gonna be doing when she's 12? Caius, I mean, he's just gonna follow right along in the same path, maybe even go faster, we'll see. And, and the reason why I share all this is because I want other people to replicate this point. And 
I also know it can't be done through some kind of mass marketing. You can go put on, you know, like they sold Hooked on Phonics through mass marketing. Well, go look at what happened to Hooked on Phonics. Because they said, oh, this will improve, blah, 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 blah. And then they, they got sued and they couldn't say those things. We can't say the things on a TV that is the reality of what we are able to do. We're not allowed to make certain claims. That's why everything we do is one-on-one, -on -one, so you can see for yourself. That's the point. So people try to give me ideas all the time. Well, you could do this, you could do that, you could market this way. It's like, we know what we're doing. And yes, I know it's gonna take time. I understand that, and that's okay. But it has to be done properly, because I'm not here just to uh, have a nice lifestyle for myself, build a big company only. I'm here to do all those things, but on the basis of other people effectively educating their children for real. Because in case you haven't noticed, look around at the world. All the chaos that you're seeing, first of all, it's not chaos. It's all planned out. It's like a chess game. You just don't know the rules of chess, so you can't see it. Or maybe some of you can. I mean, it just depends on the context, right? But there's a plan for your child from the system's perspective. There's a plan for your child. And if your child does not have extremely high, highly effective processing, information processing, reading, learning, mathematics, science abilities, if they're not an equal to my son, my daughter, my other son, they're screwed. Because there's only so much we can do right now to prevent certain consequences in the world. There's gonna be consequences to what's going on right now for all the things that's been happening since the beginning of history, but really the last four, six, ten years, it's like gone crazy, right? That's just because everything's accelerating, but also because people are not educating their children effectively. They're not. We know this, right? Be right before the pandemic started, there was the um, the national report card came out tw in end of 2019, showing that the reading levels in the United States were lower than they'd been since the early 90s when Bill Clinton was in office. And math has not changed at all. Meanwhile, you see other countries going up, up, up. Of course, that's all another discussion. It's all just memorization based. They're not really effective. Um, but even within, again, remember, there's best and then there's good and bad. But really, those are just not good. Uh, so you've got China and all their educational you know, achievements, which is the good. And then there's the U.S., which is the bad. It's all a bunch of shit because... China isn't producing a bunch of free thinking, individualist, creative people. They're creating a bunch of robots. So, I mean, in the US, we're not even creating that. We just have idiots. So the solution isn't to create a bunch of robots and do what China's doing. It's to create individuals who are absolute within themselves, who have principles, who know how to direct themselves, and who are highly effective at processing information. And that's the starting point of everything that we do, is to support ourselves, our children, and other people that will are willing to listen to us and are willing to do what it takes, which when you understand what it takes, it's so simple. It's not any harder than raising a child already. Like, and if you're like, well, I have to spend time with my child every day. I have to not put them in daycare and put them in school. Well, if you're going to just going to do that, I mean, you just might as well just by the time they're teenagers, just kiss them goodbye because that's what's going to happen. They're going to fucking hate your guts when they're teenagers because you didn't prepare them for this world. And there's a big generational gap between the Gen X, Millennial, and Gen Z. You know, the, boom gen the boomer generation did not do any favors for Generation Z with everything that, and I'm not blaming them, I'm just saying like, look at all of the college debt, all these things, and then the jobs are just going nowhere. You're not gonna have jobs available. Everything's gonna be automated. And if you don't know how to build the automation, you don't know how to create things based on the automation and create new automation and all this stuff and be creative as hell. If your child's not Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or uh, Elon Musk, they're just going to be a slave. That's the divide that's happening. And I guarantee my children are going to be the elite, the 1%. That's not even a question. I mean, it's funny because I'm talking with Katie the other day and we're just kind of you know, we like to talk, obviously, and we're talking about Max and his development lately. And I'm just like talking about something he did. And she was just like, Cameron, he's a genius. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's just it's so mundane to me because we're creating it. 
It's not like he was born and we're like, oh my god, we got a genius, wow. It's like, no, we're creating it. Seneca's a genius. They're objectively geniuses. Their memory abilities, their vocabulary, their processing abilities, their math abilities, all of those objectively, by all standards, they're genius. And what I'm telling you is that we know how to replicate that. I'm not proving it to you right now. I'm just saying it. Will it take a little bit of faith on your part to implement it long enough for you to see the result? Yes. But we had someone the other day who bought TechnoTutor as a user because they were watching Katie and watching everything she posted. They only later became a distributor, like very recently. So that by, when their child was already like 10 months old or, le, or nine months old. So they had already been using TechnoTutor the, before they were uh, had the child, when they were pregnant. She did everything that was suggested. And now she's got a 10 month old who's recognizing letters. That's not normal. And that's just one example. It just depends on whether the parent who uses it and uh, is applying it effectively and not making excuses. Self-honesty is huge. And that's a whole other topic. Um, because if you if you're like well but i i really like i really like you know my kid believing in santa because you know it just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside and i just want to keep i want them to believe that santa's real I'm like okay well then your child's gonna be an idiot and then they're gonna be mad at you when they realize he lied just like everyone's mad at their parents when they figure out they were lied to and they're gonna be like what else are they gonna believe because you, you it's like it's like you took a brand new computer that was that was like a blank slate to a certain degree. And you were like, oh, instead of connecting the wires the way they're supposed to be, <laughs> I'm just gonna do it that way instead uh, because I want to. It's like, okay, well, when your computer doesn't work and mine does, who, what are you gonna say then? And I'm gonna say now, guess what? Now that you broke the computer, you know how much harder it's gonna be to fix it? Just look at it for yourself as an adult, how fucking hard it is to change programs, beliefs, things inside of yourself. It's hard. And usually you only do it through tragedy. You usually only wake up in moments where your life goes to shit or something tragic happens. And then it's it's like, okay, maybe I'll change, but then you never really are self-honest and understand the starting point. So you end up recreating the same thing or worse or different, but just as bad. So look at the world. History doesn't repeat, it rhymes. People have said that. It's because it's a program. It's because people are just following programs. They're not, there's no principle whatsoever. So. What we're doing is bringing principles that are best for everyone back into education. Maybe they were never there, but that's what we're here to do. So as a parent, if you're like, hey, I wanna do something differently. It's not hard to do. Well, it is hard. It's not any harder than anything else. It's, it's all hard. It's like going to the gym. You wanna get into shape? Okay, that's hard. So is being a fat, lazy slob eating potato chips all day when you got health problems. That's also hard. Like then walking around is fucking hard. Like life is hard. It's just, do you want to do the best thing or not? And if for education, this is the best thing. Okay, I have to go. I've got a meeting in five minutes. Um, and I will lo upload this on YouTube as well. Not that that matters to you, but I'm going to do that later. So if you would like to share it later, feel free when I post the link or share this one. Okay, see you all later and talk again sometime. Bye.